Hi, everyone. Welcome to Genealogy Adventures. I'm Brian Sheffy. And I'm Donya Williams. Welcome back. Welcome back. We've missed you guys. Much needed rest, but we still <laughs> Yes, and at least this time it was a short rest. <laughs> yeah, just a month, but still one needed nonetheless. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, as always, thank you so much for spending the next hour with us, no matter how you're watching us or where you're viewing us from. And I'm just going to get right into it because we have a lot to cover today. So our guest today is Ronald Levy. He is a family historian, genetic genealogist, and certified project management professional who's helped hundreds of researchers build their family trees and, inter and interpret their own DNA test results. He's also the co-founder co and president of the nonprofit Louisa Harvard Foundation. Born in, in Detroit, Ron now lives in San Antonio with his wife, Frances, and they are the proud parents of three adult sons. Spitting Image is his first memoir. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about that, but mostly about his journey as a foundling finding his biological family. So with that, welcome to the show, Ron. So pleased to have you with us. Thank you, Brian and Donnie. I am so honored to be here. Thanks for making the time for me, for your interest in my story, and for an opportunity to just talk about foundlings adoption in the context of genealogy and specifically genetic genealogy. Thank you so much. You guys do a great job. I'm so thrilled to be here. Oh, well, thank, thank you. you. And we're going to start off with a kind of a softball. Um, can you explain to the benefit of the audience what the difference, what a foundling is and what the difference between a foundling and, a, and someone who is adopted? Sure, sure. Um, a foundling is a child, usually an infant, that is left alone or abandoned um, without the benefit of uh, a formal uh, turnover or handoff. And adoption is usually a, for, a more formal process where the parties either know one another or agree and come to some agreement or arrangement on how contact could occur in the future. Right? The identity of the parents in the case of a foundling is usually unknown, perhaps forever, perhaps not. Um, Often, um, mothers who are in difficult circumstances, um, could be financially, could be psychologically, um, could be socially or otherwise, um, are, they, they feel frustrated and at their wits end and unable to care for the child. And so they often take dangerous measures such as leaving the child in a bathroom, in a public bathroom or um, in a parking lot near a dumpster or even in a plastic bag. Um, and, those are foundlings. And so when those children, those infants or babies are found, um, usually it's within hopefully hours or, or days of, of birth. Um, hopefully they're cared for and they're saved. And the term that we use is to, to describe them is foundlings because they've been found. Okay. And from now, my understanding, for if an infant is actually abandoned, like you said, in a dumpster or at a church step or not in a hospital, do they still get, it's a question that's been, been asked by a guest already. Um, do they have a birth certificate? Of course, not at the time they're born, but through the process of adoption, they can receive a birth certificate, as I did, right? So in okay. my case, um, I was adopted, um, well, let's, let's talk about the old time adoptions and the current day adoptions. These, these, are, these abandonments by, you know, by uh, circumstances um, through fear and frustration uh, and circumstances um, still happen today. They are not things of the past, right? But there are resources available today that were not available in 1964 when I was born, right? Um, there is the, um, the National Self-Help Help Alliance. They're called Baby Moses Laws. And these are laws intended to provide safe havens or safe haven laws, also Baby Moses Laws, that are intended to provide safe havens for mothers who are abandoning their infants safely, and they can take the infant to um, a specific safe location, such as a firehouse, uh, an EMS center, emergent, uh, a medical center, um, a hospital, a police station. Uh, in many cases, give that child, surrender that child who is healthy um, with no questions asked, right? And so the child is taken into custody. The mother is allowed to, to leave. Um, no further questions are asked. There's no prosecution or anything like that. In 1964, and I'm not exactly sure when most of those baby Moses laws came into to, uh, into effect, but before that, those cases could be prosecuted, so it was very secretive. They would leave these babies and then run away, hoping never to be found and never to be seen. And I think that was the case with my own birth mother. Mm -hmm. And in the, I guess the timeline of your story, if I understood this correctly, you were born in one hospital, 
but you were actually adopted out of a second one. Did, did I have that correct? Right, right. So I was, I was born at a hospital. Um, my mother uh, checked in under an assumed name, I learned later. And uh, a couple of days or maybe a day or so later, she left and the hospital was unable to locate her, discovered that the name that she had been given or that she had given uh, or checked in with was false. Right? And then quickly, then I was transferred to another hospital as a boarder. So a care facility, and back then, I don't know if there were other care facilities available nearby that could have cared for an infant, but in this case, mine happened to be another hospital nearby. So I guess, for the again, for the benefit of people who are either trying to find their adoptive parent or, like I said, if an ancestor was a foundling, what was kind of involved in that hospital arranged adoption? I mean, were there lawyers involved? Was there paperwork involved that people can access? Yeah, there there is paperwork. So usually, and again, it may have changed since 1964, but there are court proceedings, court proceedings, right? Uh, someone from Child Protective Services, usually, or an agency like that, a public agency, uh, is notified, involved by the hospital. That person then becomes, or that agency then becomes sort of an advocate to the courts to say this child is found and been evaluated, deemed to be healthy and um, available or suitable, I think was the word they used for adoption, right? Um, they petition that the child becomes a ward of the state. So any fees or um, uh, charges that would be used to sustain the child or care for the child for that period of time, I assume, are paid for by the state as a ward of the state. So for that short period of time between the time I was moved to the second hospital and the time that I was adopted by my family, I was a ward of the state, quote unquote. Cool. And you just taught me something new because you just threw out the word suitable. That's a very pejorative, very subjective word. Who makes that determination and what is deemed not suitable? I'm just really curious on that one. That is an excellent question that I did not ask, but it is an excellent question. Um, you know, we can make some assumptions, which may or may not be right. My assumption would be that the child was healthy, you know, um, the child had, you know, it didn't have any apparent uh, disabilities, for instance. Now, that sounds, it is pejorative. It is hateful. It is today, in today's world, you know, um, the term doesn't even make sense, right? Because any living child is suitable for adoption. But back then, that was the word that was used to describe, I think, a healthy <clears throat> child. Yeah. Good catch. And thank you for bringing that up. That, that is a shocker. Yeah. Um, so I don't want you to think that I'm not paying you any attention. Hey, Ron, I don't want you to think that I'm not paying you any attention. I send out to everybody during this first part. <laughs> but that is, it's all very um, interesting. And one of our uh, guests is saying that you're very soft-spoken. So I guess that there is some um, audio. If you could speak okay. up just a little bit. Thank you. I'll try to turn up my gain, too. Thank you. That sounds, that sounds good. That sounds good. Okay. Now, appreciating that the United States of America is a federal system, so adoption laws are going to differ from state to state, as opposed to, say, like a country like the United Kingdom, where an adoption law in one county is the same for every other one. Mm -hmm. In your instance, in Detroit, what kind of laws did you have to, were there any laws, were there any barriers to prevent you easily accessing your, your birth records? Another excellent question. So yes, there are laws in different states and they are different, they are different from state to state and maybe even within states, county to county, I'm not sure. But yeah, some have open, um, you know, records when a child reaches a certain age, uh, whether that's 18, the child uh, is, is um, or the adult then is entitled to view all records pertaining to you know, his or her birth, uh, regardless of consent. Right? In my case in Detroit, um, the law was that um, both parents had to provide written consent in order to open those records. However, there was what was called non-identifying information. Non-identifying information is made available to people requesting it in Detroit, for instance, in, in Michigan. So non-identifying information for me was, for instance, a court, um, a, the hospital in which I was born, just a hospital, not the name of the hospital. The hospital to which I was transferred was provided, but that hospital no longer exists, right? It's gone now. Um, none of the names of the people involved, obviously those were all redacted. 
you know, false names as well as real names. Uh, so a lot of that was redacted and I couldn't get any of that information. But in other states, yeah, now you can, and recently I think a, a few states have passed some laws that, that say those records are completely open now. And I think Pennsylvania may be one of them, but uh, you'd have to check to be sure. They're different in every state. So um, question, there's never a time or a moment where there's a limitation on that? It's just forever locked, forever closed? I'm not an expert in that, but I think, again, it depends on the state. So until, if a state has a law on the books, I'm, I'm not an attorney, right? So I'm just telling you what it was in my experience. Until that law is changed in Michigan, it, it is what it is, right? You cannot get your identifying information until that law is changed otherwise. Until then, it requires both parents to provide consent. And in my case, both of my parents were deceased. So neither would ever be able to provide consent for me. Right. So the only way I would be able to find my birth parents was through DNA testing, which is what my book is all about. Mm -hmm. Which nicely brings me into your timeline. I just want, because I sometimes think it's um, beneficial for our audience to, to just kind of in their head, get a visual of a, of a timeline for this kind of a topic. So around the age of 10, or I think you were 10, was when your mother told you that you were adopted. Um, and from what I gather from the book, up to that point, you didn't have any inkling that that was your story. Because in terms of your complexion and physical characteristics, you kind of, you know, you said in the book, you look kind of similar to the family that adopted you. So you find out you're adopted at 10. Then at some point as an adult, you start researching your adopted family's genealogy and their family history. Then you take a DNA test and you find out that you had one white parent and one African-American parent and that African-American parent, like all of us or most of us, was heavily admixed with non-African DNA. And then based on those results, as an even older adult, you began researching your biological family. So my first question around this whole subject was, did you find that your experience researching your adopted family really helped you in terms of researching your biological family? Basically all the skills and lessons that you learned from your, like I said, researching one, of, one part of your family, did that come into play researching your biological family? Certainly I think it did. Um, you know, the ability to understand how different um, family search uh, tools and sites are used outside of DNA, just the ability to search records and find sources and understand um, how citations and references can be used to build a, a case, if you will, or to prove uh, paternity and maternity, right? To know that if two people are first cousins, right, that they share a grandparent, for instance, and understanding how genetics, a basics of that is all part of that long process from, you know, when I'm a teenager until the time I'm adult, just learning a little bit about genetics, a little bit how family trees are developed, a little bit about mathematics. You know, you have two parents, four grandparents, eight great grandparents and how it duplicates and how it goes on and on and how quickly the numbers build, right? A little bit about just American history um, and where people are and about the census records and information that's contained in those. So all of those are things I learned over the course of years and months, uh, aside from anything about genetics and centimorgans and chromosomes. So, so I guess my follow-up to that, I would imagine that, you know, wrapping your head around the, the records, the, the digitized records was probably the easier part. Um, it, it, I picked up in the book that you really had to learn a whole new skill set just to wrap your head around the genetic genealogy side of things. What, what was that journey like? Um, it, it hasn't ended. It's still going on. Um, in my estimation, um, genetic genealogy and understanding the terms is fraught with confusion. And it is when you first look at it, it's overwhelming. It's a little bit like, you know, turning on the spigot and getting a fire hose in the face. I mean, it's the pressure of it. It's hitting you all over. You don't know where to start, where to stop. Just learning the terms, centimorgans, understanding that we all have 23 chromosomes and that 23 pairs of chromosomes, right, from our mother and from our father. Understanding what it means when chromosomes overlap, that, that that segment of chromosome that overlaps came from the exact same ancestor. The things that we can infer, right, when we learn about 
chromosomes and how chromosomes work and how shared segments of chromosomes, what they mean. The longer the shared chromosome and the number of shared chromosomes determines how closely related we are to someone. So when you see that you share a large number of centum organs with someone over a large number of segments, then that could be you know, a very close relative, a sibling. It could be a mother or father. If you share a very small segment only on one chromosome, that could be a very distant ancestor. But if I share it with you, Brian, at the same spot, we share an ancestor, and the same ancestor gave us both that same chromosome. And that's fascinating to me. I just like, wow, that's how it works. huh? So, yeah, a very different skill set. Um, and then just, you know, one of the things that I think uh, comes together with your previous question and this one, Brian, is I had to get used to the fact that um, when I'm looking for records, especially in ancestry, and you receive those hints telling you that this may be a relative or this may be a parent of that particular individual, um, it didn't dawn on me at first that, all of the different kinds of relationships that people can have. There can be step relationships. There can be half siblings, half aunts, half uncles, right? And the person I'm looking at, you have to be careful not to accept these hints that other people have put in their trees because they may not indicate, is this the right parent for that person? Was that person's spouse married before? And is this the child of spouse A or spouse B? And that can mess up your whole research. If you're down the, the wrong branch on the wrong tree, it can take a long time to come back from that, as you both know, right? Yeah. So, you know, a little bit of both of those things. So understanding how genetics works, number one, understanding those numbers was a big learning curve. And then resetting my paradigm on how trees work and how relationships are represented in a family tree, whether it's in family search, whether it's an ancestry, whichever tool you might use. Those are all things yeah. that had to integrate. And I can imagine those names could have easily tripped you up because a lot of your ancestry is actually in Georgia. Part of it's in South Carolina. We're talking about two places that have very strong naming conventions. Donnie and I come from another part of South Carolina called Edgefield. Well, our ancestors came from a place called the Old 96. The core of that for us is a county called Edgefield. So you can get basically five sons in a family and each one of them will get will name their child the same name. They're all yeah. born around the same time, so it's it, it can be it's hellish. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. you have my sympathies on that one in Georgia. <laughs> yeah, all the Jims bury all the Marias, and then you got to sort them out. <laughs> yeah. So my question, um, I wanted to actually like talk about how you your story, just your story in general. You know, your book. You talk about it, it's it's definitely a memoir. It yeah <laughs> yes, spinning image. This is the book. Um, it's definitely a memoir. So you go through a whole lot of different things and so on and so forth. One thing that I kind of missed was when you actually started researching. Like I know that your your mom told you by the way. You know, because it was a by the way type thing, like you said, um, it was 10, you, you were 10. But when did you actually decide to get into, you know what, I'm going to find my parents, my biological parents, I just want to know this information, because it got kind of sensitive with your mom. Your mom was like, you know, I'm your mother, right? Like, you know, <laughs> she she was like that the whole time. So when did you actually, you know, finally say, Regardless of what mom is feeling, I'm going to go ahead and do this. Right. Yeah, yeah that's a very good point. Because in the beginning, when she first told me, she was like, oh, baby, anything you ever want to know, you just ask mama and I'll tell mm -hmm. you, you know, you can ask me anything, anytime. And about five years later, I said, well, mom, did you ever have any information about my birth family? You don't need no information about your birth family. I'm your only mother. You don't need it. You know, that kind yeah. of thing went down. So I, I would say the first part of my answer is, honestly, as soon as I found out that I was adopted, in a way, my research started. And my research then was just starting to scrutinize people in my own family a little bit more closely, looking at their faces and looking at the faces of people in my neighborhood and saying, you know, do I look more like one than the other? You know, looking for those those nuances. Right. But that was very, you know, obviously very um, informal and not academic in the least. But then, you know, as I went to college and really, I think it was when I got married and um, we um, experienced the birth, the blessing of our first son, I thought to myself until then, when I went to the doctor and the doctor would ask questions about, you know, my background, I had to say, honestly, I don't know because I was adopted. Is there a history of, you know, cardiopulmonary disease in your family? Are there a history of strokes or diabetes? Or, I don't know because I don't know, you know, my, my biological uh, uh, makeup, right? 
And that was okay with me as a young adult. But once I had a son, um, I thought, you know, it's not really fair. Like he deserves that. And I deserve yeah. to know that for him, you know, so that I can be the best parent to him. So then I, that's really when I got serious about trying to find out more about my biology and my biological, not so that I could have another family, not that I didn't love my own family, but just, you know, basics. I just want to know the basics, you know, like, where are you guys from? Do you experience a greater incidence of some health condition than, you know, another part of the community? I just wanted to know, you know, and then, then of course, there's just, you know, the, the cultural piece of it, right? I mean, as African-Americans, we've had enough taken away from us, right? So, you know, if I, I thought if I could find out, you know, instead of just being an African-American, that I was a Cameroonian American or a Ghanaian American or a Nigerian American, you know, that'd be a step closer. And I just wanted a step closer on that front, too. And then you found out you were all three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All three. Right. All three. <laughs> I, I missed a few, but I covered the West Coast pretty good. As we yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm all three. I, I do know that. I'm all three as well as mm -hmm. some other stuff. But <laughs> oh, okay. All right. And did and ditto. Ditto. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um one of the other questions that I had for you is you were blessed, and it, it sounds as though you were blessed to work with an amazing genetic genealogy angel. And you were part of a Facebook group that, if I remember, remember specifically dealt with foundlings, or it may have been foundlings and adoptees. Mm -hmm. And what was that experience like? And the second part of the question about working with the genealogy angel, and you might tell people about the benefits of, of going that route, is how did you establish a relationship of trust with her? Because you're giving a complete stranger some very sensitive information, some deeply personal information, and that requires trust. Brian, that's a, that's a whole hour question right there. I will do my best. <laughs> that's a super question. And thank you for asking it, because it's one thing I want to share with people. I want them to know, because as we already touched on, this is so confusing. If you've never done this before... It's really confusing. Now, now that I've been doing it for five or six years, I'm able to help other people do it too. So you do learn it. It's not impossible to learn. It's just when you first look at it, there's nothing intuitive about it. It's just, it, it's work, you know. Um, so the important thing is for people to know that they're not alone, that there is a starting place. And the best thing that happened to me is one of my first matches, my cousin Emily um, had been involved in doing some genetic genealogy already. Found out we were a match, like 51 center organs. Not super close, but fairly close. You know, about 51 center organs we shared on my paternal side. And Emily already knew a lot. I mean, Emily is in those databases that you can look up people's phone numbers and addresses, you know, like the database you have to pay for. So when you find somebody, you know, point is in my book, I said, nothing secret anymore, you guys. You think that, you know, you're hiding from somebody out there, unless you're totally off the grid, people can find information on you. So having said that, Emily said, you know, there are groups on Facebook and uh, I was already on Facebook. and I didn't know that there were these groups that specialized in different aspects of genealogy. And uh, one was called Foundling Finders, F-O-U-N-D-L-I-N-G, Finders. And if you just go on Facebook and search for Foundling Finders, you'll see, and, and when I joined that group, there, there were probably a, a couple thousand people in the group. It was founded by C.C. Moore, um, and C.C. Moore is involved with Dr. Henry Louis Gates on Finding Your Roots. She's that genetic genealogist who he consults, and she does all of the, the, you know, the scientific parts for him, right? Well, she actually founded that group. And now, you know, years later after that, there are like thousands of members in this group. I think it's over 15,000 now, right? It's grown so fast. I mean, and when I tested, I think there were, you know, like a million, you know, ancestry DNA kits that have been tested. Now it's well over like 10 million or something like that. I think it's just, it's exploded. Um, so once I joined the Foundling Finders, now that group is a private group. It's not open to anyone. So anyone, anything that anyone posts in that group is private, first of all. There are a lot of, of, um, um, what do we call them, search angels and other people who help. And they are selfless people who dedicate themselves to helping people looking for their truth, especially those that are looking for, that are foundlings, looking for their biological family. And they've done it many times for many people. There is no charge involved and they only work with you. You tell them your story, you put it out there. You know, this is the, the non-identifying information I got from the state of Michigan, for instance. Here are my, you know, my, my DNA results I'm happy to share with you. Can someone help me out? Then I was contacted by this just fantastic angel. Her name is Lenny. This is a, a pseudonym. Lenny contacted me, and uh, I told her my whole story. <clears throat> she gave me some rules. You know, this is how we're going to do it. You know, you can only work with one person at a time, for instance. Right now, if you're working with other people, 
you know, it's going to get crazy. So just pick one. Just I'm going to be your person, right? You need right. to share your account with me, you know. So I needed to trust her in that. Your your issue of trust, Brian. Very, it, it's very much that. You know, I have to trust her. She has to trust me. Um, and if that trust um, isn't maintained, then things are going to go sideways at some point or another. But in our case, it was just a great relationship. I mean, I opened up to her. I told her everything I could. She was, you know, really amazing to me that the things that she knew and how quickly she could do them just astounded me right and now i'm still not even you know half of even close to what what lenny was back then but i learned a lot from her enough to help a few people anyway mm -hmm. so yes definitely a matter of tra it is available to everyone and then in addition to foundling finders there is another group called dna detectives now the difference between this is a facebook group also the difference between dna detectives and foundling finders is and DNA Detectives works with people who might be adopted and may, may know um, who their, say, their, their birth mother is, but they don't know their birth father. But they were never given away. There may be some adoption records, right? They were adopted. There may be some other information out there, but they're not a foundling. And that's the difference between the, the two groups. Foundling finders is only for people that were abandoned as infants who are looking for their birth families. DNA Detectives is for anybody who's looking for anybody, basically. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there's a third one called DD Social. And DD Social is an offshoot of DNA Detectives. That's why it starts with DD. DD uh, Social is open to everyone. I believe you still have to, um, to sign up for it. It's not public, but it's, it's anyone can join it. And it's moderated. All of these groups are moderated. And DD Social is more for those of us, maybe, for instance, who have already found some information. We're just sharing and learning together. You know, um, so it's really for anybody that wants to talk genetic genealogy for the most part. Mm -hmm. And speaking to two people who do genetic genealogy, you know, what Donnie and I were discussing before we, all of us were even in the green room is your challenge was your matches, all of your matches were going to be half matches, meaning they were going to be not full cousins, but half cousins going all the way back to your common ancestors. So that adds another layer of complexity because if you're going simply by the the center morgans and, and all you know the the snippets and all, and all the rest of it you know it could be a first cousin once removed it could be another kind of family kind of family member you know it's just just how challenging was that well actually i think it was probably easier for me than some folks now they weren't really half all of them were not half cousins so for instance on my paternal side um I found a first cousin. So obviously we share a grandparent, right? I didn't find that first cousin first. I found a second cousin first, but we are full second cousins. The second cousin means we have a great grandparent that we share. So my grandparent had to be a descendant of that great grandparent. And then from some other information from my Y DNA, my paternal DNA, I knew a surname. And it just so happened that it just matched up perfect, perfectly. But point being, I have a lot of first cousins that I found now on both my paternal and my maternal side. The part that was easier for me, Brian, than maybe some is that that I knew that my paternal side were African American from the South. Okay, I didn't know anything about my maternal. I knew they were white, but I didn't know anything more about them, right? And it, it very quickly it became apparent that all of my my maternal side were all Eastern European. There were no English, no British, which means all of the white names who were British and English or Irish were all on my paternal side, which I wasn't expecting because my paternal oh, side is wow. what? Black, black. African-American. How do black African-Americans get English, Irish, European DNA? Slavery and before, the slave owners, right? And their, and their ancestors, right? That's where my Irish and, and English DNA comes from. It comes through the African side of slavery into me. But all of my Eastern European stuff, none of that came through Georgia. None of that came through North Carolina. That all came through Slovakia, Germany, and into Michigan and Pennsylvania. None of it through Georgia. Wow. So for that reason, it was easy for me to separate them out. I'm like, well, everybody who's related to these people are all on my paternal side. And everybody who's related to these people are all on my maternal side. It's harder for some people to pick those apart, especially if both your black and your white ancestors are from the South or from the United States, you know, recently. Right. Wow, that's that that's very interesting. Um, the fact that you can literally tell for your white side that they're which side is on your 
black side and then what side is on. I mean, I just found that. I that's, didn't have that's black side anyway. It's such a shame. I'm like, oh, I used to have a black side. I have no black side. I mean, you do. I we all, but the thing is, is that we're all like that. We all have a white side and a black side, whether we want to accept that or not. Amen. Um, we we all have that. We all have a black and a white side. We all some of us may have Native Americans, some you know, but overall we have a black and we have a white side of our family. So mm -hmm. that's very and to answer a viewer's question, uh Ron comes from Detroit. He is Detroit born and raised. So to answer that question. And so now we're gonna really get into the meat of it. You, yeah. you know, you were able to work out who both of your parents were. And this is a question that a lot of both adoptees and I imagine the descendants of foundlings have been asking is about the process that you started to reach out to these strangers that you're connect closely connect, not just connected to, but closely connected to through DNA. What was that process like? And what was the, the emotion, what was the response? I guess both emotional and practical how do they how do they feel about that gosh another long question i mean long answer short question great question long answer okay let's see if i can <laughs> parse it out here again very different on my paternal and my maternal sides okay first i got to go back to lenny who started this with me right she lenny never contacted anyone for me lenny always set up the pins and let me throw the ball essentially right or the for lack of a better analogy, you know, she would say, okay, here's, here's the deal around. This person is a second cousin and this person is, you know, a second cousin once removed, right? So if we do the triangulation and based on your Y DNA, then one of these, these people have to be your grandparents. And these grandparents looks like from what we can tell from your, you know, from um, the census records and, you know, um, residence records and other records, other public records, they, it looks like they only had three children. So one of those three men has to be your father. That's where Lenny stops, right? And now Emily kicks in. Emily says, well, this is their address, and here's their last phone number, <laughs> and here they are on Facebook. Right? So now we're on Facebook, and we know, like, you know, the, we know the, the men. We know their, most of their children, if not all their children, because you know, once you get past, you know, 1940, 1950, it's hard to track people in public records. But, you know, we were able to find, you know, through other records, their um, look like their address and, you know, their, their, the relatives that lived with them, which were their children. Right. Um, so based on that, I had a choice. Now, how do I contact these folks? Right. The second cousin that, that she identified um, turned out that person knew a lot. And that was my cousin, Francis, who really um, without Francis, Lillian Stevens, this book would have never happened. Right. And every family, I hope not every family, but I mean, if, if a lot of families and mine was blessed with at least one person who is that keeper of secrets. And you are probably those people in your own families. And now I'm that person in my family. But before me, on my paternal side, it was Frances Stevens. Frances had already done the work the hard way. She had been to Georgia in the last 20, 30 years, going through all the courthouses, you know, going through all the libraries, all of the records, the hard copy stuff before there was internet. She had a family Bible. She had all this information that we now know is a treasure because it's so rare. I never expected to find that kind of treasure trove of information in any one person. Right. But that's essentially what I got. So I called Francis one day, left a message. Turns out she was out of the country or out of the state, you know, for a few weeks, wouldn't be back in, left her message and just prayed that she would call me back. Right. And when she did, she sent me an email back and she said, yep, I know who you're talking about. I know everybody that's involved here. Let's sit down and talk. And so I was welcomed from that moment. Really, Francis welcomed me and she wasn't sure who's, you know, whose child I was and neither was I. But we knew I was around the right place. Talked to my, my aunt. Um, and one of the questions she asked me was, and I'm not too embarrassed to tell you this. I talk about colorism and racism and how it affects us all and how it plays out. But she asked, well, tell me what you look like. You know, what color is your skin? Right? What's your hair like? Because those three men that we're talking about all look like this. Right? They've got this, this thinner wavy hair. And they've got this, you know, lighter, you know, lighter brownish skin. Right? They've got large ears, which you can't see here, but they're pretty big. <laughs> so we share these characteristics, right? So and now, so my aunt hadn't seen me yet. She was asking me to just, you know, verbally describe myself to her. And that was kind of the key to getting the next door open was let's have a meeting. Let's talk more, right? So we scheduled a meeting at the library. And I can't, listen, these ladies, Francis and my aunt, 
have so much power in that family. They're like, we're going to have a meeting at the library. Ron, you set it up. We'll be there. And they marched in with these three men. And I knew one of those men was my father. Knew it. From I mean, but I was wrong. But, <laughs> but, but I knew it. And through a series of meetings and discussions and learning and then finally getting them to DNA test, right, I discovered that their father was actually my uncle. Their father's brother was actually my paternal, my, my biological father who had passed. Well, I'm... Like I want to get in because how you said, I knew, I knew, I knew. I want to jump into that. One of the things that I noticed is, you know, in reading in your book is that your imagination played a huge part. Mm -hmm. Like every time something was going on, you would create this whole scenario about what might happen or what may have gone into play. And I mean, let me just say this. You're a great fiction writer, too, because <laughs> it was very, very, it, it pulled you in. Those stories pulled you in. Oh, you. And so with that being said, how did the outcome, if the outcome didn't come out the way that you imagined it, how, you know, how did that affect you? Well, you know, that's a great question. And the timing is perfect because I think I didn't quite finish answering uh, Brian's question and it comes right in, into play with yours, right? Okay, how did it affect me? No, no, no. These, these questions, they, they go right together because the, Brian said, well, how is it, how did you, um, how did they receive you, right? So on the, on the case of my father's side, they were, they were skeptical, but, but warm. Do you know what I mean? Warm to the idea. You know, Francis said, well, you couldn't be his son because, you know, he never had any children. When in fact, he turned out to be the person that was my father. He did have a child. I was his only one. Right. So things like that. So she was she was cautious. She was skeptical. But at the same time, they they saw the DNA results and they understood the science. And they said, well, he has to be one of us. He's got to fit somewhere. Where is he? Right. And so they were all happy to to contribute and to play along with that, even to the point of one of them finally saying, I'll, I'll do the DNA test because, you know, that'll answer it for once and for all. That's all we ever need, really, for closure as foundlings anyway. All right. So then flip over to my my um, my uh, maternal side. Right. Very similar situation. We had identified um, two women that were definitely my aunts. Um, one of these three women, interesting, because it was three men on one side and three women on the other side. Those three sisters, one of those three sisters had to be my mother. Now, before I even uh, met my half-sister and identified it, that I had a half-biological sister, um, these three women, I knew who their children were before I even contacted them, and I knew the birth dates of those children. And two of the sisters had children that were born in the same year as I. Well, therefore, mm. unless you have two children born in the same year, chances are it must be the third sister. Yeah. And, and sure, so I kind of knew already. But um, how did they receive me? Um, my half sister, I, I contacted her daughter first, and actually, I contacted an aunt first and um, an aunt's granddaughter. The granddaughter was very open, Brian, and she was like, oh, well, let me check with my grandma because her grandmother is my aunt. Her grandmother is my mother's sister. And so I kind of knew this at the time. And she was so nice. She was so sweet, I'm telling you, this kid. And she called me back like a day later and she said, I'm really sorry, but my grandma says I can't talk to you anymore. So that's kind of where it ends. And, and I said, you know, I understand. I mean, I'm not going to ask you to do anything against what your grandmother wants. I would never do that, but I, I appreciate you giving it a try. Right. So then what did I do? I went to a different <laughs> cousin. I went to, you know, so. It's, it's, it's different. You know, some people will accept it and some people won't. But I think if you're going to be successful with this, you have to have a thick skin, number one. You have to expect that everybody's not going to be yes. warm to this. I mean, everybody's, you know, you're barging into people's lives. They didn't expect to find you. They don't know who you are. They don't know if you're good, bad, or what the deal is, right? So you kind of have to be prepared for that. And, and I talked with Linny about this a lot, my angel. We talked about, you know, how I would approach it and you know, some people, no matter how nice you are, no matter how calm you are, um, no matter how easygoing you may be, they just don't want to upset the apple cart or have anything to do with it, right? Because in the end, some of them know the story, and it's been hidden for a long time, and there's no reason to bring it out now, you know, 40 or 50 years later. So a lot of mixed reactions, Danya, a lot. Mm -hmm. So you think Doris knew the story? Oh, yeah. I, I, I know she did, yeah. And I've contacted her since, and she's she's the only one that doesn't want to talk anymore. And Janet has passed since, by the way. So those of you that read the book, oh, I'm sorry to so, hear that. Yeah, yeah, Janet was so sweet. So she was. There were three sisters: um, Janet, Donna, and Doris. 
Donna was my mother who died before I was able to meet her. Um, Doris was the first one I tried to contact whose granddaughter was not allowed, right? And, and I've since contacted Doris. Uh, and then Janet was the youngest of those three sisters. And Janet actually had a meeting with me. You know, I was able to get in touch with her. She's a sweet little lady. You know, I could see myself in her. I could see my nose and I could see some other features. It was really fun to see that. Um, but then, you know, we didn't have the kind of relationship with Janet that I have with, say, Francis and my aunt on my paternal side. Right? It's just, it's just, it's just a different thing. You know, like one is super warm and the other is like, okay, well, that's nice. You know, we, we know, you, you know, that's, that's good enough, you know, but, but Doris has not warmed up. And I think reason, the reason, Danya, is because Doris knows so much about what happened. And I think it was mm -hmm. a painful period for her. Because when you think about it, all those things I imagined that my mom might have gone through when I was born, it, it was probably worse than any of those things that I ever imagined. And the only person it was worse for than my mother was probably the people that were closest to her, like her and sister. And watching it happen. And watching, right, it, watching happen. it happen. Not being able to stop it. Not being able to do anything about it. You know, And now... You know, 50 years goes by, and here's this ghost from the past bringing it all up again. I thought we were done with that. So this is now, this is my new story that I imagine, my new fiction. Maybe it's true. I imagine <laughs> she just doesn't want to, she just doesn't want the pain of it all over again. Mm -hmm. Which is a nice segue to my follow-up question. So there is a lot of personal family information in the book, and I'm really curious about how that information was received by both sides of your family, both the bio and the adopted side of the family. And do you have any advice for uh, descendants of foundlings or adoptees um, who want to write their own family history book? Yeah. Um, for me, I would say it was deeply cathartic. I needed to write it. I didn't write it because I wanted to make money. I didn't write it because I wanted to punish anyone. I didn't write it because I wanted to make people feel bad or set a record straight or get some justice. I wrote it because I couldn't keep it inside. It just had to come out. I also knew that there were people out there who were feeling some of the things that I felt and who needed that closure. And I figured if I found a way to get closure that I owed it to everybody else who was looking for it to at least share it. Um, do I recommend it? You know, it depends on the person, Brian. I mean, I think the reason I yeah. wrote the book Part of it was because we went through a pandemic and I was at home and I actually had time I never had before. I would have written that book five years sooner if it hadn't been for the pan or if I'd had a pandemic five years sooner. So because the pandemic stuck me at home with time on my hands that I would have, who knows what else I would have been doing, some excuse, you know, I might not have ever got it done. So that's part of it. And I would say, you know, the other part of it is when you're, if you're a first time author, you know, be prepared to pay. It, it costs money to get these things published. And most um, well-known publishers, most, um, you know, the, the big publishing houses aren't going to take the time to assist or help or market a first-time author. So just be prepared. If you really got to get it out there, self-publishing is a good way to go now. People, you can self-publish. And, you know, the hard part is the marketing part of it. The easy part is writing the book. You know, the editing is not that bad. You know, you can pay somebody to edit it and you can, you can, you should edit it several times, not just yourself, but have other people's edit too. That would be some other advice. Get someone that's really good with cover art. I mean, you could go with a plain cover, but I mean, I like the cover that we came up with because I think it tells a little bit of the story itself, right? It's about, it's about faith, right? It's about my mother and myself. It's about walking into an unknown. It's about taking a chance. You know, all of these things kind of came through, but I could never have done that on my own got to pay somebody to do that right so the expenses involved but because i had to do it brian i did it so i would say if you don't have to do it go to the beach don't write a book <laughs> if, you, if you have to do it if you have to do it it can be done and i want you to be encouraged i don't want you to feel like you can't do it mm -hmm. <clears throat> well we have a great question from um an audience member shelly was one side of the family a little more open and accepting to you as mixed race versus the other yeah, I mean, definitely, I'd have to say that would be my um, my paternal family. I mean, because they all knew they were mixed race. I wasn't a surprise. Matter of fact, they wouldn't have let me in if they didn't know that I was mixed race. That was like that was like a, a ticket of admission or something. You know, it felt like. But yeah, because you know, if you look at my my paternal tree, you discover that all four of my paternal great grandparents were children of white men and enslaved women. And before I did this, 
we all know, you know, every African American in this country knows that there's somebody white in their background, but most of us just don't know who. In my mindset, I was thinking one or two. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't thinking all four of them. I, didn't, I wasn't thinking it was that pervasive, you know? Oh, wow. And, yeah, I think with us, we've already, we kind of figured all of that out because it's every line for us. There is a white progenitor, mm -hmm. uh, a male that's at every, every line. Because so. you, you're you sitting at nearly 70% European DNA, if I remember that number correctly. I'm knocking on 60. Both of my parents were African-American. That's how much mixture. Put it this way, I have hundreds upon hundreds of enslaved lines, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, back when they had slavery. Every single one of them goes back, well, I should in terms of the enslaved lines, because I have free people of color too, the enslaved line, every single one goes back to a white slaveholder and either a mulatto or a black enslaved woman. Every single mm -hmm. one of them. And that's the same. That's the same for me. Every last one of my enslaved lines go back to a white male. Um, well, let me ask you a question, if I may. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about those ancestors? Do you claim them? Are, do you call them grandparents or do you call yes, them? Yes, I do. I do. Now, I claim them. I even write about them because I've got presidents. Mm -hmm. I have presidents in my ancestry. Okay. Um, how I feel about them, how I feel about that connection, that can change from day to day. It can change from morning to afternoon to evening, depending on kind of what I find. Yeah. Some ancestors, I'm going to name this one because he's uh, governor of South Carolina, Governor Hammond. Mm. I, I acknowledge him, but I will never feel positive. He was a sexual right. predator. He was a, he's, he's a written, known, acknowledged, written about sexual predator. And because I know what he did to that ancestor, mm -hmm. I will never be able to forgive him for that. Yeah, I'm the same way. I, I claim mine. I claim everybody because it, without them, I wouldn't be. So how can I not say, oh, yeah, this person is not my, you know, not my relative. Make when sure in actuality, not. right, it may, when in actuality, had they not done or, you know, been where they were supposed to have been, then guess what? I would not be where I am today. I would not be who I am today. So I claim everybody. And um. My favorite is Preston. Everybody knows that. <laughs> Everybody who watches the show, they know. My favorite is Preston Brooks. And he was a senator. So, um, and he was the one that beat Charles Sumner on the Senate floor. If you, you know, you know your history. So I find him to be just fascinating because he went through, he did, because of who he was, he was just pain in a butt man, but Everything he did, he did for his family. And you don't know that if you don't research it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't dislike him. I'm not, I mean, I, I know where I got my attitude from. Or, you know, I know where mm -hmm. I know certain things. I recognize certain things in him that is actually in me. And, you know, it's, what, I what can I do? <laughs> Actually, this is a good point to cycle back to the previous question that I asked. And I'll, I'll give you an example that covers both Danya and myself, because we're cousins. We're, we're cousins in like eight or nine different ways, just in South Carolina alone. So if you are an African-American researcher and you discover that you're the descent, you know, descendant of enslaved people, and let's face it, most of us are going to be, even if you have free people of color, you may have one or, you know, still have enslaved lines it is going to go back to a European ancestor. You are going to see white faces on your DNA match list. Now, on my father's Virginia, because my father is 100% Virginia, my white relatives that I reached out to were awesome. There was no denial. There was no pushback. There was, you know, they wanted, they needed a little bit of understanding about how DNA worked and, and how we reached these conclusions and triangulation and the rest of it. But once they actually saw it and they knew, they were totally cool. And they have actually since, you know, we've become family. We've become proper family. They're just part of my extended family now. Right. Now, in terms of Donya and my South Carolina ancestry, that's a turkey shoot. We get cousins who are totally down and totally cool with it, who are white. We, but the first 
group family group I e I messaged on Ancestry, I got back, we do not have black relatives. And I'm like, well, that's funny because you're on my DNA match list. And yeah. if you click on the shared match list, you see nothing but a whole lot of black Edgefield faces. And we, Donnie and I know most of the, the common matches. All the black ones, we all know how we're related to each other, which makes yeah. it even easier to figure out how the, the white family fits in. She categorically stated, do not have black people in my family. And she said that separately. She said that to me first because I was the one that, was original I, I i popped up first with her and had to get certain things done and she just answered the phone we don't have black people in our family click oh okay and then i when when brian told me he was going to be speaking with her and i told him i was like listen she's going to tell you she doesn't have black folks in her family and he was like but i'm like but nothing <laughs> she's going to tell you and sure enough, she did the same thing. And what makes it even worse is then when she sees you in person, she claims everybody. Mm -hmm. But hopefully this tip will help everyone listening to the show or watching the show. Because I don't take no easily. Not like that. It's like, fine, I can't work with you. I can't work with your whole family group. Because as soon as I reached out, everyone made their trees private. I'm like, well, the, yeah. horse, is out of the, the horse is already out of the barn. I already know. I'm just asking for more information. I just traced those white lines back further in time, discovered that a lot of them descended from Quakers. The Quakers have amazing records. Oh my, OMG, they just have amazing records. Dealt with the cousins back in Pennsylvania who had nothing to do with the South Carolina, same family, but had nothing to do with the South Carolina people. They bent over backwards. Oh my God, yeah. you're a Hollingsworth, you're a Holloway, you're a duck, you're all these families. Um, they were amazing. Are you a Hollingsworth? Yes, I'm a Hollingsworth. We may be related. I'm a Hollingsworth too. <laughs> oh, that's right. That is in your book. That is in your book. Yes. Well, if they're Quaker Holloways and they go Hollingsworths, and they go back to places like Marlboro County in, in Pennsylvania, Chester County, those were like the big strongholds. If you can trace it back there, we will connect in some way, shape, or form. Wow. Well, well I want to get this one left. Go ahead. I was just wanted to set one thing a little straight. So it, I, I, I may have given you the impression everybody on my um, paternal side were welcoming and very few on my maternal side were. I want to give you just two exceptions to that. On my maternal side, although my sister's children were a little bit skeptical, I think they're just being protective of their mom. When I sat down with her, she knew right away. I mean, she was like, you know what? When I was five years old, my mom went away for a few months and I didn't see her. And it was a while before she came back. When she was five years old, that's when I was born. And so it was very easy for her to accept and do the DNA test. Like, you know, so we were cool now. We talk and, and celebrate holidays and things like that. Uh, conversely, on the other side of my paternal side, there is one side of that family who thought, thinks that they're the keepers of the flame, right? And that they dispense the information as they see fit to whom they wish, right? Mm -hmm. And when, I, when they learned that I had a tree on Ancestry, that well, we don't deal with Ancestry because we think Ancestry is, you know, taking people's money and Ancestry is... I'm like, you can't shut down Ancestry, you know, and mine's not the only tree out there with your family in it, you know, so to tell me that I can't have a tree on Ancestry, so we kind of parted ways because of that difference of opinion, but, you know, I guess if, I want people to understand there's no such thing as privacy anymore, right? Public information is public information. One monkey don't stop, no show, as my mom used to say, and, you know, if, if you can't get there one way, you're going to get there another, so... People should just kind of work together, I think, uh, out of the spirit of family and put those differences aside because you're not stopping this. DNA is here to stay. People are going to find out what they need to find out because I don't think I've ever seen anybody more persistent and more resilient than foundlings and people who don't know who their family are. They will yeah. find a way. Yeah. Yeah. That was the question I was actually getting ready to ask you. Kimberly Lee, she wanted to know what happened with your half sister. She's still alive and well. She's living in Michigan and uh, texted with her yesterday. She's building a beautiful uh, garden outside. She's got a greenhouse that she keeps there in Michigan during the winters. And she's got four daughters and she's got some grandchildren. I've met all of them. And, uh, you know, now that I've moved here, we don't see each other you know, often, which is sad, you know, but, um, but we do stay in touch. So thankful That's for that. Good. 
And I'm going to piggyback off of something that Donnie has said. So as we researched our families back in South Carolina, we picked up on certain family traits that we have. And I mean, I hate to generalize about places like Edgefield, but if you tend to come from Edgefield, you tend to be quite fiery as a personality, maybe have a short fuse, probably have anger management issues. Um, <laughs> Your adopted parents pass down, they, you know, they pass down certain traits to you, like your, your mom and you just, you know, you established a relationship based on honesty and trust. And in the book, you know, you just get a real sense of how you value that. As you got to know your biological family, were there any kind of family traits that you could identify with that you're like, oh, that's where I get that from? I mean, maybe, I mean, I sense that my, um, that my biological mother, uh, had definitely an entrepreneurial spirit and that um, she liked music, although a different kind of music than I like, but she liked music. Um, my paternal side, um, I, if, if, if I could only pick one thing, it would be faith. I mean, they passed, they passed Jesus down to me and they passed him down through prayer. They passed him down through teaching. They passed him down through writings um, and they've just sustained me through that. I know that my great grandparents, my great grandmothers prayed for me. And I know that my grandmothers prayed for me. And I know that my father prayed for me, even though they never met me. And they led me to them. They led me to, that's how I found them because those prayers were answered. That's awesome. That's, that's awesome. Um, yeah. You also stated in the book, how you thought Joseph was your father because you guys look so much alike. Oh my God, yeah. And and I, I was, when I was reading it and I was like saying out loud to myself and I was like, well, that's not a clue, you know? <laughs> and the reason why I said that is because my mother, no, because my grandma, no, to be very honest with you, you know, my grandmother, um, my mom has a cousin. She's like the second cousin to my mother this woman is the spitting image of my grandmother. And it, it, it's just amazing how that was. So when I read that, I was like, oh, well, that's not a clue because so-and-so looks just like my grandmother. So how are you going to go? You know, but yeah, I was talking out loud the entire time. Reading your book. Oh, I'm, I'm so glad that you did that. And I'm so glad that you shared it with me because that's kind of what <laughs> I was hoping for. I wanted to get that across to some people that, you know, if you stop there, you don't know the truth yet because right. it's not just about that but i'm telling you i saw this picture of him when he was a young man and i said now that's what i've been waiting for like all my life i was trying to find somebody that looked like me where i could say if i passed you on the street i would have to stop and say mm -hmm. you know do you know me right he was that mm -hmm. person but he passed you know before i could ever meet him but it turned out he wasn't my dad it was his brother so yeah close enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 and for the people who are watching, because there's just so many steps and so many layers, and I mean, we've, we've literally only scratched the surface in the terms of the work that you did and the, the, the journey that you undertook, what would you recommend be just a, a really good first step for someone who's a foundling, tr foundling trying to find their, find their family? Definitely, I'd say if you're not on Facebook already, just get on Facebook and go to foundlingfinders.com. If you don't use Facebook for anything else, go to Foundling Finders, use that get connected with that group. You don't have to put a pro, you know, a public profile out there. You don't have to post every day. You don't have to friend everybody in the world, but get on foundling finders and get connected with them. The other things I want foundlings to understand is at the top of my book, right? You're going to see the national uh, safe haven Alliance, national safe haven Alliance.org is their email is their uh, website. There are resources out there for women who are struggling with what to do with a pregnancy. You don't have to end the pregnancy. You don't have to give the child up in an unsafe place. You can give the child up in a safe place and um, without any repercussions, without any sort of prosecution, the baby can be safe, you can be safe, everybody wins, all right? So don't think that you're in a no-win situation. There are resources out there for you. And a lot of people love you and want you both to be safe. Awesome, thank Excellent. you so much. And really, we are kind of out of time. Donnie, did you wanna give a shout out for the next show? Um, what is the next show? The next show, what is the next show? Unfortunately, my computer has crashed, so I don't have to don't have the line. I don't, it, we just, don't. it literally just left my head. Oh my god! 
I wanted to say it was Deborah Sampson, but I don't think it's Deborah Sampson. <laughs> Deborah is, is the 22nd Slavic genealogy. That's what it is. Slavic next, genealogy. Yes. Thank you. Don, Donia saves the day. <laughs> so <laughs> next week, we, our wonderful guest is going to be stepping us through what you need to know about researching Slavic ancestry. Sounds like you could have used it, Ron. I could gonna... use it for my for my Jewish relatives in, in Belarus and the Ukraine. Um, yeah. But we are out of time, I'm afraid. Thank you, That's Ron, fun. so much for um, for joining us. Um, thank you, everyone who's listened and tuned in for um, for being here. And we will see you next week at four o'clock. Um, yes, yes. By the book, by the book. <laughs> thank yes, you. I have mine. <laughs> All right, guys, you have a great day. I'm Donya. I'm Brian. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye.